Well, welcome everybody uh, to this third seminar in the uh, of a series of seminars from the B to B Bermuda to B, B Island initiative. It's an initiative to create a framework for research and functions also some kind of a think tank to understand the uh, entire North Atlantic and adjacent Arctic Ocean as one system and how it may be uh, organized, uh, forced in various sectors. And also we try to involve um, uh, um, various uh, many countries and uh, various sectors of marine research. So the basic um, attitude which you have is multidisciplinary and um, being more on the natural science uh, uh, or oceanography side as most of us are, uh, of the organizers are, it's important for us to hear things about fisheries and and uh, today about the economy and the economy uh, of uh, ecosystems and how we could uh, in a better manner uh, integrate um, economic studies into the evaluation of uh, the North Atlantic ecosystem. And there we invite Stephen Heinz uh, from Ireland, Galway, to uh, give us a presentation uh, on that subject. So please, Stephen, go ahead. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, and thanks for the invite to present the seminar today. Uh, so yeah, like you said, I'm going to be talking about uh, some work we've been, we've been doing over the last well, four years, I suppose, in, in terms of uh, valuation of uh, ecosystem service benefits in, in the North Atlantic. Um, so just as a, a quick overview, I'm going to particularly focus in on, on two EU projects. Uh, I was involved with the Atlas and Mercy's projects. projects. I'm also, I'll talk a bit, I'm conscious that I'm mainly talking to, uh, I haven't spoken to Paul yesterday, uh, uh, I'm conscious I'm mainly talking to a natural science audience. So I'll talk a bit about where maybe valuation fits in. Um, and then I'll, I'll just go into one or two methods in particular of valuation, the choice experiments and travel cost models that we use and then just present some some results. So really, it'll be really a snapshot of, of uh, some of the work we, we've been doing. Um, but at the at the last slide, I've put up some references to where there's more detail and some publications out, out of these projects. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm not on my own in, in the work that's going on here. There's been many, many collaborators on all this work. Uh, you can see a few of them there, but that's not even the full list. So. Uh, actually, alphabetical order there, you can see Claire, who's joining us today, she's uh, Claire Armstrong in, in Trump, so uh, has been involved in a lot of this work as well. Um, so many collaborators. So the two projects, that the, the first one that was, it was called Atlas, it just finished up there a couple of months ago. Um, and it is a very large project, you can see there was over 20, 25 uh, partners involved, and it was trans, a transatlantic uh, collaboration funded under the EU Horizon uh, 2020 program. Um, so there, and it was a, a nice mix between the you know, marine scientists, fishery scientists and social scientists. And, and there was a number of uh, economists, environmental economists involved, including Claire and myself uh, and, and, uh, and a few others. So it was a nice mix. And we got to, I suppose, the, the benefit of these types of projects is we're in these valuation exercises, we're trying to come up with scenarios of change in terms of estimating how these ecosystem services, uh, are, are the values are going to change. So, but to come up with those scenarios, it's nice to be in a position to work with the, the marine scientists uh, in trying to paint that picture first. Um, the other, uh, the, in the Atlas project, we there was uh, a focus on uh, the trade-off between blue growth and ecosystem service provision. Um, and uh, what I mean by blue growth, there is, the, the, you know, there is over the last decade now, there's been a real push to, to try and encourage, uh, I don't like using the word, but basically uh, greater exploitation, I suppose, of, of our, of our uh, marine resources. And we see it in Europe, we see it here in Ireland uh, through the harnessing our ocean wealth strategy, which really uh, is trying to increase uh, the value of the contribution of the ocean, what we call the ocean economy. 
and, and we see that in Europe and, and across the globe, really. Um, so we just, here we want to see, well, how does the public, how do they trade off between potentially uh, additional jobs in the ocean economy versus uh, marine ecosystem service provision? Because there could potentially be a trade off there, even though when we talk about blue growth, really blue, that, that term blue has some sustainability uh, element to it. And that's, it's, they're, they're, it's sort of seen as, as, as talking about sustainable growth. Uh, sustainable green growth so uh, blue growth so people take different meanings from it but um and then there was we were also interested in the valuing deep sea and high seas ecosystem service benefits so uh, are how do people distinguish between uh, uh the, how do they put a, what are they willing to pay in terms of conservation or restoration on the high seas versus in, in their own uh, territorial waters and there was across atlas there was um, i think there was a Claire can correct me now, but I think there was 13 case study sites, but we focused in on four in particular, the Mingale Coldwater Co uh, Coral Reef off, uh, up in the Hebrides off Scotland. Uh, we looked at the Azores. We looked at uh, the Louvre uh, Observatory in Norway. And, uh, you, can, you can tell me, I can't pronounce the full uh, name for that. So you can tell me, tell me the, the Coldwater Coral area there, the full name for it. And then we also looked at, for the international water, we, we looked at the Flemish cap um, as well. Then in terms of the Mercies project, again, Mercies was, it wasn't so much about, uh, there was, it was more than just the North Atlantic, but the focus was on, on marine ecosystem restoration as opposed to conservation. Um, and looking, if there was, again, there was, uh, we again, there was a, a team uh, involved here. It wasn't quite as big as, as Atlas, but there was, uh, um, I think there was uh, 15 partner partners involved in this one. And you, you're, we again, there was a number of social scientists, and we looked at uh, attitudes and social acceptance of restoration activity, marine uh, ecosystem restoration activities. Uh, we did a number of evaluation exercises again, looking at ecosystem service benefits. Uh, one of them was kelp forest restoration uh, in Norway. In northern Norway, we also looked at um, amenity, amenity ecosystem service protection value from oyster reef restoration uh, in, and that was a case study we did in, in Galway Bay here in, in Ireland. Um, so, and, and again, there was there was other elements to both of these projects, but I'm just focusing in on uh, the, the valuation elements. Um, just in terms of then where where we fit in here, I, I just like this this. Uh, graphic here it's just a simple presentation of the of uh, where we fit in in terms of this ecosystem service cascade um i suppose there at the you can use my mouse you know up here this is the so the marine scientists who are you know they, they're i suppose concentrating maybe up here looking at the ecosystem processes and functions perhaps uh, and then they, we would work with them and they would help us identify what services are flowing from those ecosystem processes and functions uh, and then uh, the social scientists come in down around here where we look then, well, what are the benefits from these ecosystem services to society? And really this, this uh, dash line box here, uh, this is where the economist comes in. We're, we're interested in trying to put a, a value on some of these, uh, the, these uh, a lot, it's the change in really, the change in the ecosystem service uh, um, benefits that we're interested in. What is, uh, what is the, the value of, of a, change under different scenarios. So we would use the, our economics toolkit here. Basically, we're, we're looking at uh, you know, cost benefit analysis, analysis of uh, cost effectiveness analysis. We, uh, and we're also maybe not as, as much as we probably should, but it's going to become more important under uh, in the EU and, and elsewhere under this idea of just transition. But who, basically, who gains and who loses uh, from these changes is, is uh, something as well of interest here. Uh, and, and there's a number of methods we use, but basically the valuation exercise we undertake feed into these the CBA, CEA, multi-criteria analysis. Uh, and then the, there's a feedback loop here in terms of that, that information that feeds into, to, um, will, will, could, will have a, uh, potentially an impact on human behavior, which will ultimately then have repercussions in terms of ecosystem management again. And, and the loop co continues. So it's just a simple graphic of, of maybe where, where we fit in. But what was nice about the two projects I mentioned is that we, we, we were able to work with, with the scientists, the marine scientists, so, and, and because often we speak a, a different language and, and even some of the terms we, I think we use often 
we we have one meaning for for it and the marine scientists have other meanings and i was saying to claire there would be an interesting paper out of this uh, um where we so all across the two projects some of the where where sometimes we uh maybe what's the i don't want to say rubbed up against each other maybe the wrong way but but where there was interesting discussions going on and debate and and when we were trying to set up our our, our survey instruments we had the scientists feeding in, but the language that we had to present these survey instruments to the public and some of the language being used really wasn't appropriate to to use with the public. Um, so we had to there was some interesting discussions around that. Um, so just in terms of uh, Atlas, we, I, I'll, I'll dip in and out of the two projects here as I go, but this these were two of the of the study sites in, that we looked at. Uh, you, I'm, I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the, the Louvre. Oh, there's the full. Lufoten Vesteralen is that I don't know is that a good pronunciation or not? But this these that was the the Norwegian site we, we focused on, and then the the Mingale, um the Mingale reef complex there off uh, off the island of Mingale in the in the Hebrides of Scotland, and within these surveys we 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 carried out valuation exercises within the sort of the public surveys that we carried out in each of these in Norway and Scotland and Canada. Um, and we we well, as part of that though we would have, we were interested in picking up more information on attitudes and and what people knew so so we had a whole load of, of questions there and, and we published papers uh, uh, just focused on the attitudes uh, of these uh, of these different populations so in this case I think it was there was approximately one thousand individuals interviewed online surveys in each case in Norway and uh, Scotland but just looking at so just for example here, I, I, I just put up an example of one of the questions asked here, how, how well do you think Scot the Scottish Norwegian deep sea areas are managed? And uh, so on a Likert scale here, they were asked to, to reply and you can see there the percentages, how they reply in each case. So you can see they're quite they're quite similar bar poor, where, where the, the category of poorly and you can see a phenomenal difference between Scotland and uh, Norway. Now. Uh, we think this may have, have something to uh, to do with uh, uh, at the time, and I, I don't know is it an ongoing issue. But at the time, there was it was quite con uh, there was quite a bit of controversy around whether oil exploration should have been should be uh, allowed in this in this uh, area in this general area, and we think that may have been feeding into this fact because if you look at um, another question here in terms of the environmental quality. Uh, what people's judgment was of the environmental quality of their of their uh, nation's uh, seas in the Norway case only it was less than 15 percent uh, if I remember correctly that said that it was uh, poor or very poor so it, it really doesn't translate so I think there might that, that's what might be going on there but but again interesting uh, to see uh, their their thoughts this is another one um, this is from the Mercies project I have to keep these straight in my own head now um, uh, yeah, this was was again. This was looking at um, uh, potential restoration, uh, but again, we asked about attitudes towards marine re ecosystem restoration. You can see here um, where we asked them: did they, did they believe that a part of the marine ecosystem should be restored by replanting coral, seagrass, or kelp, or whatever it might be? And you can see there that that most people agreed. If it was damaged, that yes, it should be uh, agreed or, or strongly agreed that it should be. Um, um, at least a part should be um, restored. Not, it wasn't as strong for that. That the complete ecosystem, marine ecosystem, should be restored in situ if it was damaged. The, you can see again the blue and orange sections there. That it's not a, as large in terms of percentage coverage there as the first one. And then uh, the third option here was a marine ecosystem uh, ecosystem restored elsewhere that is a considered of equal value would also be okay. And again, some agreements, but uh, less so. Uh, you know, so that so the. These are the type of questions. In this case, this was again. This was in Norway. This is looking at the support. Uh, were people willing to pay in by in some manner for these uh, uh, restoration efforts? So again, we were asking about would they participate in a crowdfunding campaign uh, there? And you can see that that's in in green. Uh, maybe not the the most preferred option uh, out of the lot. But you can see there at the last one. Would you pay to support a national ecosystem restoration fund financed by increased tax? And this. Uh, you know, it's a relatively strong agreement there. If you see agree and strongly agree there, the blue, um, it must it must come to what uh, forty, just on forty five percent there. 
So, which is quite interesting. Um, and then the middle one, would you pay to support a targeted local marine? And again, that one, you can see a strong support there in terms of, of agreement there. Um, but if I agree and strongly agree, uh, if you combine those two together there, it's still uh, less than, than the national level one, uh, which is interesting because we saw elsewhere, the more local it is. In the Italian case, we saw the more local it is, the more it was preferred. Uh, but here it doesn't appear uh, uh, to be the case. And yet, again, a bit of uh, discrepancy there between that and the last, uh, the last or not the last one, but the management uh, question. Um, so again, there's, there's we've some work published on that. Um, just in then getting on to the, the valuation, um, it doesn't know, just I put up this one, this was some work uh, colleagues were, were doing uh, in terms of a qualitative assessment uh, using existing values. But in this case, the values, um, the values aren't monetary here. They're not, they're, there wasn't an attempt to put a monetary value. This, this was based on expert opinion. So you can see there, um, well, it's maybe difficult to see there, but this, there was, <clears throat> we used um, the UNIS um, classification for habitats, the, what's that, European Union, oh, what's that stand for, National uh, uh, Natural Information System. Right. Um, so we use the habitat classification, or my colleagues did, I should say, uh, use the habitat classification system here uh, and overlaid it on each of the case, the 11 case study areas. I'm, I'm just showing one here. This is case study one, uh, again, Lou, the Louvre. Um, and there's been some work done in the literature uh, by uh, people who have, who have used expert opinion to put a, a high, low, uh, or negligible uh, value on the ecosystem, different types of ecosystems flowing from different uh, benthic habitat types. So we use that. Uh, I have it's uh, Gal Casoro et al. Uh, 2014 and Sal Salomidi et al. 2012. They they would have put these expert opinion uh, databases to, uh, 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 together for for the different. Uh, 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 benthic habitat type. So we, we overlaid that on our uh, benthic habitat information that we had in uh, each of the case study areas, just to get a, a qualitative, qualitative assessment of, of what was going on in each, in each case. Now, in some cases, it's not relevant at all. It's, it's more, you find the, 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 the further out you go from the coast in terms of these uh, habitat types, often the, the, the level of ecosystem service uh, uh, flowing to, to society, the benefits society get from them are, are diminished. Uh, in particular, okay, maybe not so in the case of provisional ecosystem services uh, such as fisheries, but in, in other ones, the cultural, uh, the, in particular, I'm thinking of cultural, I suppose, recreational opportunities, um, uh, but even some of, the, some of the other supporting ones, they, they're just not they're not uh, as visible and they don't have the same impact maybe uh, on uh, coastal co or co communities or communities more generally. But that's just, I just wanted to put that up just to show that it's not all about monetary valuation. You can use these, uh, these again, it's, I suppose, uh, you're, you're using a qualitative assessment here to, to uh, say something about the ecosystems flowing from particular areas. Um, but then I suppose the, what we, what we as environmental economists, what we were particularly interested in uh, and, and sorry, that qualitative assessment for all the case, the case studies across the Atlas project, uh, there's a report written up on that by my colleagues, um, I think should be available on the Atlas website, if anyone's interested. Um, so yeah, and then as environmental economists, we were particularly interested though in, in trying to look at actually putting some monetary values on, on uh, some of the ecosystem services flowing from some of these different habitat types. And one of them we looked at here was, was uh, kelp forest restoration in, in Norwegian waters. Um, and this was just as, just before I go into this, I, I, I just want to say how this choice experiment works really. We, in, within these surveys we do, do with the public, if we're carrying out a choice experiment, we basically are presenting a, a, a choice card where, where there's a, a different alternatives alternative, op in this case, management options uh, on each card. Um, and these are associated with different attributes and different levels for each of these attributes, okay? And each, alter each management alternative also has a price. And we ask, that, that we presented these choice cards 
to the respondents to the surveys and we asked them, okay, based on, on what each of these management options are going to cost you, uh, which alternative management plan would you prefer, given the different levels you're getting for each of the different attributes and the price you're going to have to pay? Uh, and they don't just get one card, they get a series of cards. And in, in this case, I think it was uh, eight, they got eight, eight choice cards. But, but based on the levels in each alternative and the options they choose, we can then model their pr the preferences for the different attributes. And these attributes I'm talking about really are, are the ecosystem services, um, the, the levels of the different types of ecosystem services involved. Um, so this, it's a particularly useful method, valuation method when we want to uh, look at trade-offs, how people trade off between different attributes um, in, in any given situation. And now in, we're sort of, we are pushing the boat out a bit here because we're dealing with good uh, uh, um, ecosystems here that aren't that familiar to, to the public. So, but, so you do have to take a lot of time within these survey, surveys to explain you know what you're talking about what these ecosystems are what the attributes uh, are the, the yeah the attributes what are they telling you what do the levels mean so you, do, you have to be careful with setting up these um these choice experiments um so this is an example of a choice card we would have used in this case so you've got three options here uh option a option b and option and this no change option so you can see um in this case there's always a there's, there's, the attributes we're using here are biodiversity. Uh, in this case, it was abundance of macro invertebrate species per meter square. So this is this is in the kelp forest example. Uh, a, a juvenile fish abundance per meter squared. Uh, the total area of kelp uh, forest to be restored, and then always you have a price, or in this case, it's presented as an annual increase in personal income tax. And you can see here across, there's a number of options. You get They get different levels in each case for each one. Uh, for the total area to be restored, we, we also we presented it in meters square, but we also described it in terms of soccer pitches because people sometimes have difficulty with picturing what the hell 2,000 meters squared is. So it, they, it's easier to describe it in, in terms of a number of soccer pitches. So this is this is a choice. This is for, was just for a very def, uh, defined area in terms of area to be restored. Uh, and you can see across the options, they, the, the levels of each of these attributes vary. But always, we all, in every single card, the third option, the status quo or no change option, whatever it's called, doesn't change. That always remains the same. It's saying this is the way it is at the moment, uh, or this is basically the sta status quo situation. Now, sometimes it can be described, this is the, uh, this is the way it's, it's going to be at some point in the future if we do nothing, really. If there's no change in management, this is how things are going to be. And I suppose that the, uh, my colleague Wen Wenting Chen from Neva in, uh, in, in Oslo, was, she was, I suppose, behind this uh, particular uh, choice experiment. She was very interested in this because she, they're, they're very interested in, in what's going on with uh, um, the, oh, what's the sea urchin barns, uh, what's happening there with sea urchin barns and, and what, what could be the value of restoring uh, some of the kelp uh, kelp forest area uh, and, and this this one like i said this third option always remains the same on every single card no change and it's always associated basically there's no additional increase in personal uh, tax so base so given and the, across the cards the different levels shown on each card will vary and based on based on how uh, the respondents which option they choose which a b or the no change option based on how, which option they choose across each card, we can actually use that information then to model preferences and preferences for management plans with different levels for each of these um, uh, ecosystems, ecosystem service levels. Um, well, they're not, sorry, ecosystem, maybe I shouldn't call them ecosystem service, these attributes, I'll say. Um, and, and basically what we do, without going into any great detail here, we, we come up with what's a choice model, a model of preferences. So. In this case, this is just a simple, I'm just putting up here a simple uh, conditional logic choice model. Um, and and they're, they're, this is just a very a very basic example of, of these choice models. Uh, but based, you can see based on the different levels, we can, we can say something about what are the um, preferences for the different types of uh, attributes shown there and, and the levels associated levels. So you can see here, 
that in this case, it was abundance of macro invertebrate species. So the biodiversity uh, um, uh, attribute was the most, that one had the highest coefficient. Now, you, I, this isn't a marginal value. We can't read this off direct, but I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Uh, but but that saw the highest uh, that that had ha, is has the highest magnitude, um, and after that then you're talking about uh, the total area to be restored. Now it was interesting that we also had in the final model that we that we chose. It's not shown here, but we had interaction terms here with with people who actually use the marine environment in some way for some recreational pursuit, and that has a major bear uh, uh, that has an important impact on. Um, the preferences for these different attributes. And it was interesting to see those who, who used um, the marine environment in some way for recreational pursuits, they, they were basically interested in what the, the total area to be restored. After that, that was what, that was, that drove their preferences. After that, they had, le they were less concerned than what happened after that, which was interesting. They, they, they seem to be more interested in the size of the playground in some respects. Um, even though, again, these other variables would have been significant for them as well, but not as, as uh, strong an effect. But basically what we can do with this information then is, uh, and, and, I, uh, and again, um, yeah, what we can do with this information is we can set up different scenarios. If we go okay, within this particular one, if we, in, if we, we can look at, okay, well, what if we aim for full restoration here, implement a plan to remove the, the sea urchins, uh, put in place and so that we achieve uh, the highest possible biodiversity levels here, the, that the highest abundance in terms of, of juvenile fish uh, and the largest areas to be restored. So we, we can play around with what those scenarios are uh, and we can even change here. In this case, we can even change what we determine the status quo is. Maybe in this case, we're saying, well, it's going to be, if we do nothing, it's going to be low abundance of biodiversity, low abundance nurseries of juvenile fish and uh, no area, no area is going to be restored. But we could compare, um, you know, we could change that status quo to the alternative as well. But in this case, it's it's the no uh, priced option. But and from that, then we can work out. In this case, it's it's a random parameter load, just what we call model. But we can work out basically what is the welfare impact for each for this combination of attribute levels under this scenario compared to some other scenario. And this is the medium level restoration option. Uh, just so we can compare compare across, and then this is useful information. This is that fifty nine euros twelve that represents the euro per person per year, and it was it was set out in the survey that this was a, a, going to be I, I think it was a, if I remember remember rightly a ten year uh, uh, plan, so they would be paying this over a ten year period. But we can use that information then in a cost benefit analysis to see well is it worth our while is it worth our while. Uh, okay, I won't, I won't say it's a word of while. It's just additional information. It's not like we're, we never uh, advocate that decisions are made purely on the basis of cost-benefit analysis. There's a lot of other, other considerations to be, to be made, but it's additional information. That's, what, that's what, where, where we're, the angle we, we come in at, I suppose. Um, so, so it feeds into that cost-benefit analysis situation. But often the case here, you know, it it's, can be relatively straightforward to put together um, the information on the cost side, but it's very difficult to, to factor in, well, what are the benefits you get if you go to the effort of restoration? What are the benefits? And it's even more tricky when we're talking about um, the marine, because a lot of the benefits that society gets, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not uh, market-based values. They're, they're what we refer to as non-market benefits. And yes, they do have value that, uh, you know, as an economist, we talk about them entering the utility function of, of individuals. They, people do put a value on this. It's just, they don't have, they don't go, it's not like buying an apple in a shop. They don't, uh, that it's it's a public good that's provided, but they still, you know, they will pay to, to see it conserved or to even see it to be uh, restored if that's what's needed. Um, so that, that's where these uh, these types of valuation exercises have, have value. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, here, I mean, there's there's a whole host of other benefit values to kelp forests that we don't pick up on. We we can't we can't shove in all the, the potential ecosystem services here. So we only we talked again with the scientists on, on the project would, would have worked with us to, to tease out well, what what services should we include here that, that may be of use to policymakers and of use, uh, you know, to consider in, in a cost benefit analysis situation. Um, okay, 
so just and then elsewhere then in, in the atlas project we also we had like i mentioned we had we had these four areas and we were interested in questions like do do the general public value uh protection in the marine environment uh does the, this value differ between ter territorial waters and the high seas um and we brought in in terms of uh, looking at between territorial waters and the high seas we brought in uh, we decided we would look at the Flemish cap and we would we would also run the survey in uh, Canada as well. Now, now the in this particular, we had different, uh, there was a number of different valuation exercises going on. In this particular case, we ran, uh, we, we had 500 respondents to the Flemish cap survey. Now, the, the, in Mingele and Louvet, there would have been uh, separate surveys going on to, with, uh, with a thousand participants answering the survey instrument um but in the flemish cap one it was we again we were limited by budget by what we could collect so we it was 500 in each case so we, we ran we ran um these choice experiments in in the three countries in scotland norway and canada asking about again at you know knowledge about the flemish cap and a choice experiment were people willing to pay towards um uh conservation efforts in the flemish cap but also we were interested in see well how do people are people certain ecosystem service um attributes how do people trade off maybe an increase in certain ecosystem services uh, versus a potentially increases in in blue grow in blue jobs the jobs in in the marine environment in these areas um so and that was we were interested in that and and then as well we were interested in uh, is there a distance decay effect? So are, 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 the further away you are from these international areas, are, you might expect people are willing to pay less. Um, you know, that there's a distance decay effect. Um, so again, what I, I'm not, the, again, in this case, the, these were um, uh, the attributes we used. In this case, we looked again, we described health, what we, healthy fish stocks, size of protected area, we looked at marine litter and then the creation of marine economy jobs in these areas. Now, these are this was in um, the, these are in the Mingale case. In the case of Flemish Cap, the jobs to be created uh, were uh, described as 100 jobs, 200 jobs, or no employment change in the area. Um, and you can see uh, this is the deep sea. So again, working with the scientists, these these levels may appear low. In terms of the number of items of litter and, and we describe what litter is here and in this case it, it's generally fishery uh, sourced litter here but the number of items you know they're realistic you know if it's poor well then you're still only talking about five to eight items of litter per mile because of the where you're talking about this is out in the very deep uh, seas um so so again there's a a uh, colleague of ours that they've written a paper up actually we we worked with the the scientists the scientists had, as part of their work program were coming up with indicators of environmental status uh in the deep seas so we would work with them in terms of of how we set up these attribute levels and 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 they've um again the one thing working on these european projects you realize people's names are very tricky um what was it? giorgio Caz 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 Dinis. I think it is AL in Ecological in, uh, Indicators Journal. They have a paper published on, on on those indicators, but we would have made use of of this and discussed these with with the scientists, and 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 they they fed into our choice experiment. So again, uh, and again in this case, we we would have varied the size of the protected area to be protected here. This it, this is described in terms of the Sea of Hebrides, but for the Canadian sample, I, it was described in terms of the um. The size of in relation to the uh, the purport what size it was in relation to the uh, Vancouver Island and I think in the Norwegian case it was in relation to was it the size of Denmark I think Claire can confirm that uh, so we we varied that and and again I was I, the, you know from a, a lecturing perspective I was particularly interested in in, in this one because we try to link um some of these attributes particularly uh you know the, you can observe these on a cruise in terms of the number of, of items you see you can pick up in 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 your area of investigation uh and also here at healthy fish the in terms of the background information we describe this as you know the ratio of juvenile to uh adult fish uh, observed in terms of, of rating rating the health of the fish stock so the uh, um so these are things these are things that you know I, 
it's a nice example with environmental economists, uh, economic students to take this valuation example and show we, we would go well before COVID, we, we did a nice day trip out on the Celtic Voyager with some of our master's students where we just, you know, we would use a lot of the information coming from the scientists. So it's just nice to see where that actually information com comes from, how it's gathered. So uh, actually it's probably one of the highlights of the, the master's students year. But we, it's a nice tool to, to have the, uh, to have this type of choice experiment and show them how we use that information and how it's gathered potentially on, on these uh, cruises. Um, okay, yeah, and so again, this is this is um, uh, the Flemish Cap area. It's uh, outside uh, the exclusive economic zone of Canada uh, in the high seas area, what we would call high seas. There's quite a bit of activity there you can see going on in terms of oil and gas. Uh, of, uh, there's um, uh, important fisheries obviously here um, and uh, I, there would be coral sponges sea pen um, habitats here as well so the, again we would have given background information and and then I mean what we're trying to get here is in this case I'm just showing here um, these are the different levels here the health tree would be the highest level for the biodiversity attribute uh, litter tree was the, the best uh, management in terms of the litter um, and so on. But you can see there um, the litter, the taking care of litter was, was, was deemed the most important here. Uh, now, yeah, look, the, the litter is so much in the public eye um, that marine litter has become such a focal point in marine pol uh, pollution um, that it maybe it, it's, it's, it, it, it will dominate. It, it's not surprising that it dominates. But, but you can see um, what, what what was interesting here actually in terms of distance decay is that it wasn't always the case that um, the highest marginal values were associated with Canada, uh, not at all. Um, although in this case, it, it almost looks like it, it, it is. Um, but what was, um, sorry, uh, it was in terms of the highest level of health and also in terms of uh, the highest area to be protected. And again, interestingly, um, jobs here, whereas it, there was a quite a substantial difference between the, the uh, preference for, for blue growth uh, in, in a management option uh, compared to the Norway or Scotland. So again, which isn't, you know, this is okay, we would expect that. But then it's interesting then to look at in terms of litter, to look at something for the highest level of litter management, Scotland put a high, much higher value on it than what Canada uh, or uh, Norway would. And these, these are all converted to uh, Canadian dollars here for comparison purposes. Um, so that, that, I mean, there's an inter interesting story to be told there. And maybe some of this, this particular focus, and we did, we've done some work on it in the UK. There was uh, really after the Blue Planet 2 um, documentary series David Attenborough there was a there was a, I suppose an explosion in awareness and an interest in, in in marine litter and and the effects it potentially has on on, uh, on the marine environment um and actually we, we there we have a paper written up on that it was we we asked a question within these surveys we asked about respondents if they'd seen the BBC Blue Planet 2 series so these surveys would have been conducted in 2019 so it would have been I think uh, just over a year since that series would have first aired uh, on, on BBC. Um, but it was interesting. We, we did find uh, it had a significant impact on the preferences uh, that people had for a number of these attributes. But having said that, it, it didn't have, it didn't translate into a, a cha any statistical difference in terms of their willingness to pay uh, for uh, the, the different uh, ecosystem service uh, services being delivered, which was interesting. But we, we have a paper written up on that. And the other thing we did, we took the opportunity, we had conducted these surveys, uh, the Flemish CAP survey in uh, 2000, like I said, in 2008, I think it was mid 2000, May, May 2019, I think I'm, I'm correct in saying. Is that right? Yeah, around April, April, May, I think it was 2019. But we still had some money left in the budget for this. And, and we said, well, wh why would we, we've done this across three countries. It'd be really interesting to rerun these surveys to see, do the environmental preferences and their and willingness to pay, does it hold uh, across such a, a dramatic shock to, to, to the economy? 
Um, so we, we reran uh, the surveys in, in each of the, the three areas uh, with exact same choice sets were presented in, in each case. Um, and and it was it was reassuring because because based uh, based on I suppose rational choice theory we would expect preferences to hold, uh, and whatever about willingness to pay you would expect the ordering of preferences won't change and, and it, we find that uh, that does indeed appear to be the case that preferences there was no statistical difference in in in, uh, in our preference coefficients. Uh, pre and and post the first wave of the pandemic, which was really uh, fascinating to see, and we and, and in general for the, the individual level willingness to pay, it did hold for the highest level of each of the attributes. Although we did see some variation uh, in in the distribution of willingness to pay uh, across uh, some of the attributes. Um, so it, again, and we're just we're, we've been writing that up and, and dealing with the comments from reviewers at the moment uh, on that particular paper. But it was a really interesting piece of work. Uh, to be involved with, uh, and, uh, and look at, this is, is quite a complicated good, and if we knew the pandemic was coming down the road, we would have chosen a, a, maybe a simpler uh, choice experiment to, to run that particular analysis on, but it was just the opportunity was there, so we, we decided to go, go with it, but uh, it was interesting to do it, an interesting piece of work. Um, so yeah, and then just finally, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm way over time, I'd say, but I don't think I, I don't know if I'm way over time, um, but just this is another piece of work we were doing, um, looking at, again, another type of ecosystem service here, but this is on the recreational side, and it's uh, more coastal than deep deep sea, but this this was uh, just a local path in, in Galway Bay that nearly every winter, you can see there, it's very low lying beside the coast. It's very popular amongst the local population, but it, it basically gets chunks get torn out of it every year in terms of storm surges. Um, and within the bay here, this would have been historically, uh, the, the bays here would have been, would have had very important uh, natural native oyster uh, oyster reefs. Now there, there's, there's a spattering left in, in this particular bay now, but they're completely, but they've been fished out for, you know, oh, oh, generations. Uh, but there's a bit, there is efforts taking place now to try and restore uh, these oyster, native oyster reefs. And there's a, it's, a, it's interesting doing this work, you know, reading some of the history uh, uh, and how important these reefs were to the local communities. It uh, has been uh, interesting. Um, but so we, we, here we looked at, um, well, we decided to look at what would a, this path, we, we surveyed the walkers and, and using what's called a travel cost model, basically we, we created a, a demand function for the amenity. So we, we, we looked at how many times the people were using this, this walk on an annual basis um, and what distance they were traveling. So that based on the distance they travel, we can estimate a travel cost. And basically it's, we set it up like, like any demand function that the, in this case though, the quantity is the number of trips taken and the price is the key determinant here. Price is the travel cost per trip for each individual. And that will vary depending on where they're coming from, what distance they're traveling, how, the mode of transport, and so on. But we also factor into the model as well other the characteristics of the individuals. Are they a dog walker? Are they male, female? You know, so that'll have a bearing on the number of trips taken as well. And then with that demand function, we can actually estimate well, what is the what is the amenity, the use value of this site to the population of walkers that have been using it over the last 12 months. And we then what we did was we compared that then to, um, so these are some of the estimates um, that we, the, the consumer surplus per trip, that's the estimate of the use, the use value, the access value to the site. And the, uh, it worked out, it's a very locally used site here now. So it worked out at about 11 euros 20 per trip uh, per person. Um, I, actually, the other thing, I, usually when we carry out these types of exercises, we, we never know what the total number of users are on the site, but actually what I, I managed to get my hands on a people counter that I set up here along the path here. And over a 12 month period, I actually got an accurate count of the number of people passing by. So I actually, unusually, actually uniquely, I've never had it before in any of these exercises I've carried out. I actually uh, had the exact, pretty accurate estimate of the exact number of trips taken uh, to this site. So I can, work out my aggregate use benefit value in this site and it works out a mean value here uh, uh, 642,000 uh, uh, euros uh, per year. Now that 
that doesn't seem mightn't seem like a huge amount um uh but uh, uh, sorry in brackets here is our is 95 percent confidence intervals um but it, it's still in terms of what it would cost it's a very useful in terms of looking then in a cost benefit analysis situation uh what would this what would if the in order to protect the site there's options of either putting in some kind of hard gray infrastructure to uh, some kind of uh um revetment uh, you know a permanent wall or, or rock armor uh to stop this being damaged every year or the alternative as an option is uh is restoring the oyster reef as as a nature based solution so we can if we factor that in and this is i'm just this is a um sensitivity analysis we we carried out just looking at the, these different options so here the, the annual benefits here is 642 thousand as i said that was the mean value now in, in other scenarios here i use the lower bound estimate of, of the of the benefits uh, the lower bound in, in terms of the 95 percent confidence interval and i can work out here what's of interest though if i just if we were to put an oyster reef bar restore that run it, and i we, we worked out you know what it would cost to put the 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 base in here to the, the bar itself uh, and this the to put the seed on and so on. You're talking about that the cost of that, uh, the net present, we work out the net present values of the benefits versus the cost of, of putting in place these options. And you can see the benefit of using, the benefit cost ratio is 20, 20 great, perfect. Uh, the benefit cost ratio of using the oyster reef uh, option is, is 20 versus the revetment, which is still, the benefits still outweigh the cost, but it's only just above one, just above unity. Now, there's a number of uh, different scenarios here. I change so five minutes, or I'm near. I'll stop now after just after this. Anyway, I'm nearly done. Um, just in terms of the, the you know, realistically, uh, I know the oyster reef on its own probably wouldn't be enough to protect the site. So there's, it'll be some hybrid model, and this last one just looks at where you have the oyster reef in combination with some some uh, maybe rock armor options that where you allow for. Uh, annual cost, uh, a much higher annual cost um, uh, in, in uh, this final option, I think it was an annual cost of 100,000 as well in the oyster reef. But it, even then, the, it, the benefits outweigh the costs, uh, the benefit cost ratio. So it was just, it's a, again, a nice and the spreadsheet with, with these different scenarios. And it's a nice tool to have for the students as well to talk about the potential options here. Okay, so look, at just in conclusion then, you know, this, it's research, it's important. Uh, of research for the European Green Deal and the EU Biodiversity St Strategy 2030. That, the, the Biodiversity Strategy uh, talks about the need for the quantitative measurement of ecosystems and their services and values and their incorporation into accounting and reporting systems used by, by business and the public sector. Um, and, and like the valuation evidence we, we've been producing, that can feed into national maritime spatial plans, which are due in 2021 uh, in Europe, uh, in the EU, and the Marine Strategy Framework framework directive cycle assessments. And, and just on that last example of valuation, it's not just the restoration, but it's, it, you know, that, that restoration is great, but it, it can also be nature-based solutions solving other problems, and it can be more cost-effective way of maybe sol solving some of these societal problems. And in, this, in that particular case, looking at um, uh, coastal erosion and coastal damage from increased storm surges, which are likely uh, to increase. Okay, and I, I sorry if we're going over time. I'll stop. I'll stop there. I think you're muted still. We can't hear you. Okay, you're coming. Yes. Still technical problems here on this side. So the uh, uh, talk is now open for uh, questions, and you could put up a hand or uh, put your name uh, in the chat, and then I will give you the word. I think the first one uh, out with the question is Jack Dip, please. Well, Stephen, that was really very, very interesting. But the, the one thing that seemed to me like all of your case studies. Uh, tended to be pretty small areas, right? very, very local focus. I mean, a Flemish cap was further away, but still, I mean, it was a really targeted. I'm wondering if these kind of techniques could look at 
you know, kind of like big ecosystem service kind of conflicts. And like I think around here right now, they're just starting to talk about large scale offshore wind development. And there's huge arguments, you know, this, what's this going to do to the fisheries? What's it going to do to the whales and this and that? And can you do the same kind of analysis on, on bigger problems or does it get too unwieldy? You, it, it, you can, but it, in general, it's, it's, it's used for, it, it's, these techniques are used more so for projects. So at a, at a fairly, you know, a particular scale. I mean, we have, we have say here, we've put together um, what, what you can do then. So you might, you'll do it at this probably level because at this level, you can then use the values you generate in what's called uh, value transfer. You can then, you know, if you, you can multiply it up so that if, if in this area, this is what it's worth, well, then maybe if it's going to, if we try and implement this in a bigger area, well, then we can adjust the, the values to take that into account. But in, in general, we would the, the scenarios that are presented are usually at uh, at the scale of a project because it, the public find it you know what what is the value of um, you know uh, I'm trying to think of an example um, you know of the whole of of the Norwegian coast of, of it, it's very difficult if if we were to present as as we're going to uh, restore. Uh, kelp forest right across the whole entire coast of Norway you know that's that's it's a hard thing for for the, uh, the public maybe to get their head around in terms of what they're willing to pay to achieve that now you can you can absolutely do it and and you see you see it done uh, it, actually that's part of that in that that example that would probably actually work fine because it, they're paying through general taxation so they're saying yeah okay uh let's 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 uh, set up the, the the survey like that you do have in all of these particular these the choice experiments uh, and these other types of stated preferences where people are stating their preferences you have to be very careful with how you describe them um because you know th there's uh people can just ignore the fact that okay we're this is just a project level uh versus the whole coast of norway Okay, so you have to be very careful saying like this is there's a, you have to present present it in a manner that they they are clear that there's other uh, and we do we put in this language about you now because you have to think about the fact that there's other uh, areas that could be funded here and you may already be paying into some kind of conservation fund through your tax taxation system so please keep that in mind and so on um, so it's it's not a yes or no answer you can set them up at different uh, spatial scales yes but in general you see them used for smaller projects. But let me ask a question. Uh, if uh, there is also something called the national economy, when a nation makes decisions about fisheries and coastal zones or uh, oil or whatever, uh, uh, what kind of connections are there between the type of science you do and let's say, and the decisions made on the national economy level? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I so, uh, say in terms of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, there's a, has been a big push to try and link these ecosystem service services and values to the different uh, ocean economy sectors. So, how does the activity? If I, if we want to, you know, the, we have national level goals in terms of increasing the output of, of our fisheries. But how does that then? How does that translate to to the impact on different types of ecosystem other ecosystem service service services? And that's we try and make those linkages again working with the, the scientists what are what is that linkage between increasing uh, the fisheries increasing uh, um, or so increasing the fisheries to what what it, how does that flow through to a change in the ecosystem services and then what is the change in the value of those ecosystem services so so with that those we try and look at those linkages and i, I would have been involved here in, in terms of the national assessment in ireland for the marine strategy framework directive and we would try and trace out these and uh, these linkages. Now it's, it's not easy; uh, it's by no means easy. But but again, and, and again, it would might feed in through. If you think of this push on at the moment to, to try and increase the uh, area under marine protected area status in in, in uh, European waters and and here in, in the Irish waters, and they're very conscious of well, what are what are the trade offs here? What is, what is the value of the fisheries taking place here versus the other ecosystem service benefit value flows out of these uh, these different uh, for, from these different different areas that could be chosen? So, so there is definitely linkages in that manner. But there is there, we would also in terms of the work we do, we would 
look at, uh, again, a part of our work here looks at putting together ocean economy statistics for the different uh, industries in, in what we call the ocean economy. So we would look at turnover, gross value added, uh, employment numbers, and, it, and again, try and paint that picture of uh, how, how are the fisheries related back to the ecosystem services for, in that example. Now, I try to have an overview here on questions. I think the first uh, question is to Bob. And after that, uh, please, Bob. Thank you. And thank you, Stephen. This is fascinating. And I'm thrilled to see these kinds of dimensionalities entering into the conversation. I, I, I have a question, to, to kind of two part question. How do you bring the rate of change into this? How do you you know, we're living in a, a condition where things are changing rather rapidly. Let me give you an example. This is uh, 15 years old ago, but uh, <clears throat> every species in the ocean and on land, in the air, etc., has an optimal species temperature. And <clears throat> um, we found Capelin had moved 300, 300 kilometers north, uh, roughly north of uh, of, of Iceland. And um, the capelin is a, is a feeding box stock for, for a cod. And so cod was moving following it. So these rates of change affect the underpinning. How do you get that into the, the discussion? Um, because uh, the, the rates of change are on the time scales that we're trying to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, uh, we're, we're we're limited in what we can do in that regard. I mean, Claire, Claire now has a, would be uh, Claire Armstrong does a, quite a lot of work with bio bioeconomic modeling, and and I think it would feed in there more. Uh, that particular example you're you're talking about, in our case with these stated preference appro approach approaches, we can we can tweak the scenarios based on the attributes we include, but we're limited to to that. Uh, and and so the scientists we can work with scientists and they can they can advise us on what we should include in these in these choice experiments and and then we can look at different scenarios but but we are limited to what we have included in the first instance so in those examples I put up um, you know we talked about species numbers but you're but you're right because uh, and we and that's the other thing we we tend to talk about valuation of ecosystem service benefits but it may not it could be you know the language has been has been changing in the last couple of years to talk about ecosystem service values because it's not always benefits like you say the changes will benefit maybe a new fishery somewhere else and but it's a loss to to locals here and again as economists i suppose we are often accused of being more interested in the size of the pie rot versus how it's divided up right so we're we are we're trying to put an estimate on the total value, uh, say, of, of uh, the ecosystem service provision, as opposed to who are the gainers and losers. And again, we're there is some work in that regard, uh, but we, I suppose we're not as good at looking at that particular aspect of it. So look at it; it's, there's no easy answer to that question, but it, we're limited to what we include in terms of, of the attributes that we that we have. Um, and it, and and again, I always say with these valuation methods. I know, sometimes we present this work and, and you'll see someone will grab a figure and say, this is the value of uh, whatever, uh, carbon sequestration or whatever it is. But it's far better. They, these, the, particularly the choice experiments, they're really useful in comparing one scenario to another because you can see the differences in the welfare effect. But, but just these one single figures, it, it's not good to be throwing them up because again, we're, we're only capturing a small component of the overall ecosystem serve ecosystem values because we can't include everything in, in here that's of relevant. I mean, in the, that last example of the oyster reef, we just focused on the use value. It's the, the use value that is given by its shoreline protection services. It acts as a, as a uh, reduces down the effect of storm surges. But of course, it's got water filtration services, nutrient uh, um, it's a provisioning service in, in its in its own right in terms of uh, cons consuming oysters and so on. So so we're all, we're only picking on one up on one aspect of it there in that in that last example. So we have to be conscious of all these elements. And I know that the natural scientists uh, they're quite suspicious of what we're trying to achieve with with these maybe techniques, but 
but we're, you know, it's just it's it's additional information is, is what we're trying to provide here. Uh, and and we all what I often finish my talks on the on a point saying, look, at no decision should be fully based on uh, these values or or, or a, a cost benefit uh, scenario, but it just provides decision makers with additional information. All right, uh, I look at my watch and I have uh, there is opportunity for one more question and that goes to uh, Ole Övertet, please. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Stephen, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have a, a question that was uh, uh, attached to the, relating to the service that you did, especially or, or both in, uh, both on the, uh, in Ireland and uh, in uh, Scotland and in uh, uh, Lofoten. And because we see the, the there's a, there's a, this willingness or uh, an incentive to um, to to go for uh, to investing in protection of the natural environment and the ecosystem. Um, but my question is, and maybe you said it, but I, I'm still curious about it because I, then I didn't catch it. What is the who who did you ask? Is was is that people in that region? Uh, and, and a follow up question is also. Have you looked at in this or other service or other um, other uh, projects um, a differentiation between the people living close to ocean or nature, and uh, how how it uh, the opinion on these issues will shift as you move away geographically from from the 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 the, the ocean or the yeah the natu natural natural uh, spheres. Yeah, thanks for that. I just actually realized I didn't put up the final, the final uh, slide there is just where you get more information on all this and, and I know that I, I, the share the slides are, are there to share. Um, yeah, sorry, and I should have made that clearer. The, the, your first point there on the, sa the, the samples, we would have in this case, because of uh, restrictions um, and well, budgets, these were all, all done online. Now, often for choice experiments, which are a bit more complex, we, we would usually do them face to face with household surveys. But in this case, they were done online. Um, and in each of those in Scotland, it was at the national a national level sample of a thousand uh, individuals. In Norway, it was at the national level. And in um, uh, where else was it again? Scotland, Norway, Canada. Canada, it was Canada, yeah, yeah. Canada. It was at the national level as well, so it was it was at the national level. But I I would have put up a, a very simple model there. I showed you the choice model that we had there, a simple conditional logic model. But we would factor in with that we would interact variables, uh, socio demographic variables with those attribute levels to see what effect does it does distance distance from the coast that that you reside from the coast have. What effect does uh, being uh, someone who is involved in marine recreation, uh, recreation uh, being female, whatever. So we would interact those variables as well within the model, uh, in the final models we choose. So, and often, yeah, you would often see that distance decay effect that, that you mentioned. So the further away from the coast you live, maybe the, the less you're willing to pay in terms of uh, marine uh, conservation or marine restoration. But the effect is 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 less obvious though probably when you're talking about out it's deep sea so it's it's far away whether you're on the coast or not for people people some place like you know Norway Norway Scotland you know very maritime nations so they would I don't I don't think uh, no matter what distance you probably live away from the sea in those cases it's going to have uh, uh, you're going to be willing to pay something because you're you're so especially in Norway I think because it's such an important component within within uh, you know. Uh, GDP, uh, the, the marine makes such a huge co contribution compared to somewhere like Ireland, where it's it's only makes a contribution of maybe uh, one or what is it uh, one or two percent, uh, which is nothing uh, compared to the case in Norway when you think factor in oil and get oil, um, fisheries, aquaculture, and so on. Um, so yeah, but we would uh, we would often see it, that distance decay effect. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> definitely uh, exists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for the um, discussions and the questions and answers. And um, yes, there is some uh, silent applause to Ireland. Thank you. <laughs> and and um, we uh, have come to an end because we don't want to have it more, much more than an hour. 
Sure. So thank you very much for the contribution. And um, then we uh, welcome back some of the uh, people here at uh, the regular meetings and future seminars. And we will keep you updated what we are going to do with this type of initiatives you stand for. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And if anyone has any qu further questions, you can just look up my name and, and you'll find my uh, email address uh, or, or Paul or Jenny can pass it on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you.